morning, everybody. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Esra, Esra, Esra Jan will defend her academic thesis, Probation Officers in Turkey, the Relevance of Attitudes Towards Offenders. And may I invite you, before we go to the opponents, to present a summary of your study and the conclusion of your thesis. Um, highly esteemed prorector, highly esteemed members of the Corona, my supervisors, family, friends, uh, online and on site, uh, thank you for being here today. In the following 15 minutes, I'll provide uh, an overview of my dissertation titled Probation Officers in Turkey, the Relevance of Attitudes Toward Offenders. I'll start with a brief background. Uh, probation is a community-based sanction, and it was originally designed as an alternative to incarceration. Uh, there are a few milestones in the history of probation services. I'd like to start with that. Mid-1800s marked the first examples of probation. The voluntary of John Augustus in the United States and Matthew Hill in the United Kingdom, uh, they started with voluntary activities uh, toward delinquent children uh, and adults, and this formed the basis of probation as an alternative to punishment. 1907 is the first formalization of probation services. Uh, probation of the Anders Act of the UK Parliament, uh, and with that, probation became part of the criminal justice system in UK and also in many countries in the early 1900s. 1990s marked the rising of the Get Tough movement, and the focus of the probation system shifted from rehabilitation toward law enforcement by then. In the following years, rigorous research was conducted. Um, this documented the ineffectiveness of punitive strategies in uh, reducing recidivism. Also, a number of rehabilitation programs were successfully implemented. So these initiated another shift this time toward a combined approach. Uh, today, probation systems embrace a hybrid approach uh, in which rehabilitation and law enforcement functions are balanced. The situation of the probation system in Turkey is quite different than this context. Uh, the related literature is very scarce. Um, the Western context, the, the probation services was really well, well established, however, in Turkey, the system is quite young. Therefore, I'd like to give four striking numbers I think would be quite helpful in getting an idea about the relevance of this dissertation also. Turkish probation system was implemented in 2005. Uh, today, we can say that the system is in its adolescence years and trying to find the right stance in the uh, criminal justice system. In spite of its short history, the caseload on its shoulders has folded 100 times since 2005. Today, there are 700,000 probation case files managed by only less than 4,500 probation officers. So these statistics make Turkish probation officers an important subject to study. Uh, with our line of studies in this dissertation, we aim to make a contribution to the scarce literature uh, in Turkey while providing some actionable implications for the improvement of probation services. Specifically, we aim to explore the professional experiences and needs of Turkish probation officers, uh, to investigate the relevance of probation officers' punitive and rehabilitative attitudes in their professional conduct, and to investigate the factors that were related with public punitiveness. So we conducted five studies. In chapter two, uh, we wanted to get to know the Turkish probation officers first. 57 officers and five directors from Istanbul participated in the study. Our research process unfolded in three cyclical stages. Uh, with a series of separate focus groups uh, involving both officers and their directors. According to our findings, POs reported case overload, too much pa paperwork, experience of role conflict between law enforcement and rehabilitation functions, 
and serious job burnout. They were highly motivated to improve their uh, rehabilitative skills, but they felt constrained in the highly punitive criminal justice system. Um, they mentioned needs for professional training, such as clinical interviewing um, and interpersonal communication skills. They also needed a more concise assessment tool. And um, they needed to know the effectiveness of the work they were doing. For example, one of them said, I sometimes feel like I'm wasting my time. I would like to know if what I'm doing really works. However, there was no way to answer this question because there is no recidivism data in Turkey. Um, director's responses uh, to this was they were mostly um, um, agreeing on what the probation officers were saying. However, they were kind of targeting a, a bigger picture. For example, they wanted to make clear the goal of the uh, criminal justice system, more specifically the probation system, if it's law enforcement or rehabilitation. They wanted to collaborate with other state institutions, non-governmental institutions, uh, universities, to create a network of judicial care and rehabilitation services. Uh, the findings of chapter two paved the way to a series of studies around attitudes toward probationers. Now, in chapter three, we investigated the link between attitudes toward probationers and three dimensions of job burnout in POs, namely depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and professional accomplishment. Lack of a risk assessment tool led us to the study in chapter four. We investigated the factors that influence JPO's judgments in assessing probationers' risk. In chapter five, we investigated the role of gender role attitudes toward male and female offenders on public punitiveness. Of note, public punitiveness is considered uh, one of the most prominent factors of increased governmental punitiveness. In the last chapter, we conducted an intervention study and measured the uh, impact of a one-day risk-need uh, responsivity-based training um, on JPO's punitive and rehabilitative attitudes and their recidivism risk perceptions. Now I'll give the research questions and the highlight of our findings from each study. I will give a little bit more detail on chapter six. In chapter three, we investigated if Turkish PO's attitudes toward probationers were associated with job burnout. Our findings show that having more positive attitudes toward probationers could help in increasing PO's sense of pro professional accomplishment and decreasing the sense of detachment from probationers. In chapter four, we investigated the link between JPO's punitive and rehabilitative attitudes and their recidivism risk perceptions about justice uh, involved male and female youth. Specifically only for male juvenile offenders, increased punitive attitudes toward probationers predicted recidivism risk perception scores, higher recidivism risk perception scores. In chapter five, our research question was, how do gender role attitudes of the public moderate punitiveness toward male and female offenders for violent and nonviolent offenses? Our findings show that gender role attitude of the participant is a significant predictor of public punitiveness regardless of offense type and offender gender. Chapter six was a quasi-experimental study that examined the impact of a brief RNR-based training uh, on Turkish JPO's punitive and rehabilitative attitudes and their recidivism risk perceptions. 59 JPO's were recruited through three probation offices in Istanbul. Uh, they filled in a pre-test survey that took about 10 minutes first. Then 36 POs received a one-day training on RNR principles and the model of offending behavior, and 23 were waitlisted. After a week, they completed the post-tests. 
we wanted to examine the amount of change in punitive attitudes, uh, rehabilitative attitudes, and recidivism risk perception scores from pre to post test as a function of intervention condition. Our findings suggested that a brief RNR-based training program was effective in reducing Turkish JPO's punitive attitudes toward justice-involved youth in the short term, we should add. We found no interaction effect of training and time on rehabilitative attitudes and recidivism risk perceptions. I'd like to share with you some major scientific and social societal impact of our studies. This dissertation contributes to the limited uh, empirical knowledge on the Turkish probation system, more specifically punitive and rehabilitative attitudes of the Turkish probation officers and the general public. Our findings align and expand on previous research from a number of academic and practical disciplines, including clinical psychology, social psychology, criminology, and social work. The studies in this dissertation sparked a collaboration with the Turkish Ministry of Justice and UNICEF Turkey. The training in Chapter 6 was subsequently improved as part of a larger uh, youth probation program. Uh, we started the program in 2017, and it took like 18 months to complete the project. Today, some major changes in juvenile probation system have been implemented as a result of this uh, project and the findings. To conclude, in this dissertation, several actionable implications regarding attitudes toward offenders have been suggested for the improvement of probation services. Some urgent and important needs of the Turkish probation system are implementation of an evidence-based risk assessment tool, availability of recidivism data, and clarification of the system goals, rehabilitation versus law enforcement. Our finding emphasized that the needs of the um, probation officers deserve more attention in the quest for a better probation system. Attitudes toward probationers may be an individually modifiable target in improving mental health and professional competencies of JPOs and probation officers. A brief RNR-based intervention can be a response to the needs of the probation officers, and at the same time, it has an impact in changing attitudes toward probationers. And last, but not least, fostering egalitarian gender role attitudes on a societal level is crucial for reducing punitive attitudes of the public toward offenders. One last word, collaboration. Uh, on a common rehabilitative vision is necessary. Uh, and this is a both top-down and bottom-up effort, uh, including but not limited to policymakers, institutions, the probation personnel, and the public, which means practically all of us. So thank you for your attention. I'll now give the word back to the project. Thank you very much, candidate. Uh, for this comprehensive, nice, and beautifully, uh, beautiful uh, presentation. Um, the opposition will be opened by Professor De Vogel. Uh, professor De Vogel is endowed professor of forensic mental health care at the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience of our university, and she also served as chair of the assessment committee. So the floor is yours, okay. Professor De Vogel. Thank you. So first of all, dear candidate, I would like to congratulate you and also your supervisors for finishing this very important work. And I think you've been a real true pioneer. And I hope that with the results and the new insights that current practices in Turkey will uh, improve. And I also think that with the participatory design and also the project you describe in your impact chapter, that you already made a contribution to that. Uh, still, I also think there's a long way to go. And um, I have several questions, but I am mostly interested in your ideas for further improvement. Like you just said, it's in the adolescence phase. How can we go to the maturity? And uh, how can we uh, educate and train the probation officers better uh, to do their job in a good way, but also to keep them motivated? Because one of the most remarkable 
things in your thesis, and you also just explained is the extremely high caseload of the probation officers. It's really, really high. So um, you uh, emphasize the attitudes and the implementation of risk assessment, which I really like, so that's a good thing. But tools may not be the only solution. So um, I was thinking about more like responsivity factors, the interaction between the probation officer and the clients. And uh, in the Netherlands, we did some studies into the working alliance. So having agreement about goals, uh, mutual trust, bond, etc. And we found especially trust to be related, uh, a predictor for recidivism, but also for job satisfaction because it may help the officers with their dual role of caring and controlling. So I'm wondering what your ideas are about uh, improving the education and what is needed uh, also from a perspective of policy makers. Hello, esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for your question and your kind words. Um, well, that's a quite... Um, Let me say a large topic. Actually, may, maybe I can start from uh, from the policies in Turkey. And we started in 2015 with the study on gender role attitudes, um, and then we were lucky to find a way to reach the probation services and have a chance to gather some data from the probation uh, officers. Uh, with the first study we did on probation officers, we could hear that they needed more training and more interaction with other institutions, other, other governmental institutions, um, universities, and they were really uh, thirsty for some know-how uh, because they said, we're so young and we don't have the know-how, mm -hmm. I think we need to know more about the, uh, uh, the policies in Europe, for example, and uh, some good examples that we can implement here. And this is how we found in ourselves in that project with UNICEF and the Ministry of Justice and um, the, the government. It helped a lot, as you said, but now there's a long way to go. Uh, I think the most important thing in, in Turkey specifically is the, the policies, the governmental policies. We need to be clear on uh, the role of the probation system. Is it punishment or is it rehabilitation? Because otherwise, if, we, if you're not clear on this, we wouldn't know which training to give, really, because they already have lots of law enforcement trainings. They, they know the rules, they know the um, law enforcement practices. They have taken lots of trainings on that. But in terms of rehabilitative ideals, this was probably the first training that they got. Um, however, there was, I think, our findings also suggested that there was a ceiling effect probably, glass ceiling effect, because no matter how rehabilitative they wanted to get, there was a point that they couldn't be more rehabilitative, because we thought this was because of the punitive justice system, because they have to stop somewhere, because the system is expecting them to fill in the papers, uh, to, to, um, to monitor their probationers, um, so they have to keep good files, and this is a lot of law enforcement work. Uh, as you said, that would be great if they could, for example, we, we get a little bit of CBT in the, in the RNR-based training. Um, it, would, it would be great if they could collaborate more, and this is one of the uh, things that we mentioned a lot in our study uh, with, with UNICEF because we had a chance to give one-to-one -one trainings to the probation officers. Um, the most important thing that we said there was whatever the probationer does, it was with the juveniles actually, whatever he does, just ask yourself, what does he need? 
even if it's something very uh, terrible, like, how can he do that? Why don't you ask yourself what this juvenile really needs? Uh, so I think it needs a shift of mindset. Uh, rehabilitation needs a shift of mindset from um, what can I do to stop him to understanding what does he need, so how can I fulfill this need and how can I help him? Uh, yeah, as you said, there's a long way to go for us in Turkey, but we have some clues that it might work, but um, the most important thing would be, I think, the policymakers and the public also, of course, because they are very interrelated, um, have a more rehabilitative vision mm -hmm. uh, in everything else, actually. And possibly also because you mentioned the lack of recidivism data, so more information about that, and, and maybe also more information, I didn't really, maybe I missed it, uh, the profile of the clients, what are their mental health problems, and how can you be responsive to that? Is there also a exactly. need for more studies? Uh, that's, that's another problem. For example, when I said 700,000 case files, it's not the number of probationers, it's the case files. So that means uh, I only know, for example, I like committed five different crimes and they are five of the 700,000. But if I want to know the number of probationers, the software doesn't allow us to mm. find that. Mm. So uh, we cannot really uh, get, a, get the file of one person and try to understand what, what he needs so that we can make a tailored intervention for him. Um, yeah, we, we really need to get these statistics for better interventions. Yeah. You're right. Okay, so. thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Vogel. Um, the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor van der A. And we go from Maastricht online to Malaga, if I'm correct, Professor Van der Aar. Professor Van der Aar is a professor of criminal, criminal law and criminal procedure uh, at the Faculty of Law of Maastricht University. And she was also a member of the assessment committee of your thesis. So welcome, Professor Van der Aar. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, dear candidate, I'm really sorry that I can't attend your uh, ceremony there in Maastricht today, uh, but this will have to do. And uh, I would also like to begin with um, congratulating you on your manuscript. Um, your thesis makes a significant contribution to the existing body of literature, but perhaps even more importantly, it also has had a positive impact on Turkish probation services in practice. Uh, for instance, uh, as evidenced by the Dengue project that you have worked on. Um, so you actually managed to bring about positive change to the system, and I think that is no small feat. So my compliments. But of course, I also have questions. And my question uh, basically focuses on chapter four, in which you investigate um, the probation officer's punitive, or punitive uh, attitudes and their uh, perceptions of recidivism risk. You found out that for male juvenile offenders, uh, more punitive attitudes of probation officers were associated with higher recidivism risk perceptions. Now, of course, I can understand that too negative an attitude is not good because of the risk of overestimating the risk of recidivism. But perhaps having too positive an attitude is not good either, in the sense that that could lead to the exact opposite. So underestimation of the risk of recidivism. And I wonder if we are training these probation officers in the hopes of creating a more positive attitude towards probationers, aren't we also increasing the risk of underestimation of recidivism risk? And to put it very bluntly, aren't we creating probation officers that to a certain extent are a bit too naive then? Especially since uh, previous studies have demonstrated that the gender of the probationer does in fact uh, play a role in the risk of recidivism with male probationers or delinquents um, having a higher risk 
of falling back into their uh, criminal behaviors. So I wondered, or I would like to invite you to elaborate a bit more on um, the risk of underestimation of recidivism risk in uh, probation of officers with too positive an attitude. Should we address that risk as well? And if so, how? Thank you very much. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and your questions. Uh, definitely, you're right. Uh, well, to be honest, uh, after we finished all the studies and when I ba went back to read the whole dissertation, uh, I was a little bit more hopeful because the Turkish probation system, I mean, the system in general, the criminal justice system, is punitive. So finding hope of some rehabilitative approach was, was good for us. But the next step would be pursuing a hybrid approach, as you said, not, not too rehabilitative and very little punitive. Um, maybe this is one of the reasons why we chose to use two separate scales, uh, rehabilitative and punitive, punitiveness scales in our studies after the first, first one. The first one in the job burnout was a continuous scale because we saw and the literature shows that two attitudes can actually survive at the same time at a you know, level. It's not like they are mutually exclusive. If you're too punitive, you're not rehabilitative at all. But in two separate uh, attitudinal approaches, I mean, you can be in the medium for both or higher in one and medium in another. So I think that's where, as you said, we should uh, focus on being. Um, I think for the Turkish probation system, we were too excited to make it more rehabilitative. So this is why we did not really focus that much on the hybrid, the balanced approach, uh, finding some kind of hope in the rehabilitation system was, was very exciting. So uh, you're definitely right that would being too rehabilitated would probably underestimate uh, the, the risk of the probationer. Um, on the other hand, what you said is definitely true. We know that male uh, offenders are more likely to, to commit uh, offenses than, than females. So maybe it looks like, yeah, they're right. I mean, what they uh, actually thought without the presence of a risk assessment tool uh, was quite right. Uh, maybe we could say that. But there is this uh, danger here, I think, um, because this is an extra legal factor. And there are several extra legal factors. And I think this is the limitation of, of the study in chapter four. Um, we did not put too many background information on the, uh, on the offender. If we had done that, probably we would have a better idea uh, about, about this question. But here, the extra legal factor, the only extra legal factor is gender. And obviously, in literature, it says so. And they gave a kind of correct answer, we could say. But there's still this danger. Without the availability of a risk assessment tool, there's this danger of making too much uh, subjective judgments and going wrong. Um, so this is definitely something for future research that we should be more careful about. Thank you. I fully understand the excitement, by the way, of finally, you know, seeing evidence of certain rehabilitative changing attitudes. So I, I fully comprehend the focus of your uh, manuscript. Um, if I have to twist your arm, really force you to make a choice, and this is a devil's dilemma, <laughs> would you think it is more urgent for the Turkish system to implement um, an ev evidence-based risk assessment instrument or to, uh, to do these trainings to change the attitudes of probation officers? also given the, the limited financial resources that you have? Um, 
actually, the very first thing that should be done is to decide uh, on the role of the, of the probation system. Are we going to be rehabilitative? Are we going to be more punitive oriented? And only after that, if we know this, there will be trainings to be a little bit more on the rehabilitative side, for example. And only after that, we can give trainings that will work. Otherwise, as we have seen in the RNR training, it, mean, it made a little difference in punitive attitudes, but not rehabilitative attitudes. So there is a, there is a wall that we crush uh, if the system doesn't allow us to, to get more rehabilitative. Um, so I think it will start with the, with the policymakers and the public who will ask for this, and then the, the rest will come, hopefully. Okay, thank you for your answer. Well, thank you, Professor van der A. Uh, and perhaps Sunny Malaga. Um, the defense brings us back from Spain to uh, Maastricht again, uh, and the next opponent is Professor Otgaar. He's Professor of Legal Psychology at the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience of Maastricht University. And Professor Otgaar was also member of the Assessment Committee. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, well, not only was I impressed with your thesis, I was also highly impressed uh, with your presentation indeed. So I agree, by the way, of the uh, evaluation that my Prorector gave. It was a really nice um, presentation of the sets of studies that you conducted. And I was impressed with your studies um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason uh, is because there was a wide variety of methodologies, qualitative type of studies, but even an experimental study. And second, uh, they were well written and some of them were even published, uh, showing that some people have already looked at it and uh, deemed it relevant enough to be published. Um, I especially like the inclusion of this experimental study um, and that's also the, um, related to the question that I have concerning your thesis. So I also want to congratulate, of course, your supervision team because it shows the, the, the nice collaboration that you have together uh, leading to this very nice set of studies. Well, my questions relate to your experimental study in Chapter 6, six in which an r, &R training was given to juvenile probation officers. Your main result, and that was also shown uh, at the slides, was that the training led to fewer punitive attitudes but did not lead to significant changes in rehabilitative attitudes or recidivism risk perceptions. So your chief conclusion, and I quote, is that future research could expand on these promising results. That's what you noted. And my, my question concentrates on whether your results are actually so promising. Uh, and I've reasons to argue that perhaps they're not so promising. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. So let me elaborate on it. So in your method, so th there are three things, three issues uh, in your chapter of which I wonder whether they are so promising, and again, I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. The first thing is this. Uh, in your method and results section, um, you noted that the training and control group that they statistically def differ on education level. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, more bachelor degree participants were included in the training than in the control group. You stated then that at baseline level, no statistical differences were found between the training and control group in terms of your dependent variables. So you checked this. Uh, and you, you, you then stated that because of the lack of these statistical differences, educational level was not included as a control variable. I wonder, didn't you dismiss this too early? Uh, the reason is, could it be that because of the training, uh, bachelor degree students could have benefited most of this training than other participants, maybe because they are more naive, etc. And therefore, shouldn't you have also looked at group differences at post-test, not only at pre-test? And more importantly, uh, if I'm correct, you did an overall analysis. You looked at the dependent variable as a function of bachelor versus graduate degrees. Shouldn't you have included the factor training versus no training in this analysis as well? That's the first. The second uh, reason uh, about your results relates to the figure that you presented in your presentation and which is also depicted on page 112. So here you state that the interaction 
concerns the finding that punitive attitudes decreased more in the trading than the control group. However, when I look at this figure um, at page 112, 113, I see something different. Um, I see, I interpreted the interaction differently, but again, I might be wrong. Uh, but it seems to show that actually the interaction is about that at pre-test you have group differences, while at post-test post -test, they are not. So that's a different interpretation than stating that the punitive attitudes decrease more. If I look at the interaction, it seems as if there are differences at pre-test, not at post-test. That's the interaction. Um, and then the third uh, um, reason is a, a conservative judgment of your results could be to say that even if you would have found that this training would have led to a stronger decrease of punitive attitudes for the training and control group, you did not find any evidence for the other key dependent variables. So two of the variables, nothing was found and only one was. So based on these three reasons, I wonder w uh, whether your results are indeed as promising. Um, and if not, what would you do to make them more promising in the future? Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for your kind words and your questions. Um, okay, so in terms of your first question, um, you asked if about the, the education levels. Um, now let me let me go step by step so I, I will I will think on the way. Uh, we started with the, with the pretests first uh, when we found that there was a difference in the education level between two groups, the training and the control group. We checked on the pretest if education level had any effect on punitiveness scores. We did not find uh, a correlation between them. So if this, and, and also the other variables, we checked other uh, variables. So we said, if there is no difference, we can, we can use them, uh, the education level, without controlling for, for it. Uh, the two groups of people with a bachelor's and graduate degree, they are all probation officers. And they had around, like, if I'm not mistaken, around five years of, of work experience. So um, being a bachelor degree, having a bachelor degree or a graduate degree, um, probably, um, and as our results showed, would not make a difference uh, in, in their attitudes. Um, and also the other like work experience and, and other variables did not make a difference. So we decided to keep the education level uh, as it is. Um, and for your, um, after, after the study in the post-test, um, we found only a, a difference a, between two groups in the amount of the decrease in punitive attitudes. So the result, the, the interaction you're asking on page 112, actually, in the beginning, it looks like there is a gap. But we checked for it, and it was not significant. The difference in the punitiveness between two groups was not significant in the beginning. But what happens later is that the decrease, the, the difference between the decrease of two groups is significant. So this is, we, we performed a mixed factorial uh, ANOVA, and this was what we were looking for, actually. The change in punitiveness, uh, as a function of training and condition. Um, so, um, only for punitive attitudes we found a change. And is this promising? Um, yes, yes, we, 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 we think it's promising. There's so much to do. However, uh, one thing 
very important thing between we, Gina Winston's study, this is where we actually um, kind of repeated uh, her study, and she found differences in rehabilitative attitudes, for example, and we did not. Uh, we thought the difference in design, her use of a risk assessment tool and the implementation of a risk assessment tool was, the, was what made the difference. Because implementation of a risk assessment tool is not only for predicting future crime, it's also, it has, Tamara Dove's study has uh, lots of information on that. For example, it uh, um, makes a better collaboration between, uh, between probation officers and better co communication between the officers and their directors. And it looks like the, the, the context changes. Dear, so, dear candidate, I'm going to interrupt a little yeah. because of the time constraints. Okay. Okay. Uh, could you finish the answer to uh, your opponent now? Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, so the results are, uh, yeah, very little effect, but it calls for future, uh, future research, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I think you have convinced me much more that they are indeed promising. I would have, uh, I have a small sub question, but I know there is a shortage of time. So maybe if there would be a second round, I would ask it then, or else maybe at another time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Otger. Um, from Maastricht, we go, uh, well, pretty far to the beautiful city of uh, Istanbul. We go to Turkey, because the next opponent is uh, Professor Eskin. He is a professor of clinical psychology at the Koch University in the beautiful city of Istanbul. He was also a member of the assessment committee. Um, thank you for being a member of the assessment committee on behalf of the university. And thank you for being present uh, here today, uh, Professor Eskin. The floor is yours. This microphone is, is off. I think, uh, Professor Eskin, your sound is still muted. I'm sorry, <laughs> I just missed it. And <clears throat> thank you, Rector. And uh, <clears throat> I start with congratulating the candidate and the supervisor for this uh, impactful fact thesis uh, and manuscript. It's well written, and uh, I enjoyed reading it. And then. Um, my question is uh, to the candidate is uh, that she discusses and she has also uh, start try to empirically investigate the rehabilitative and um, uh, punitive aspects of the officers probationer of probationer officers. Uh, so th these are two opponing or to opposing uh, concerns also from the society, societal side and from the uh, officer side. And now, <clears throat> and you seem to be sided with the, um, with the rehabilitative concerns more, but there are discussions in the Turkish media and in the past, especially in the nineties where um, rehab actually framing or talking about rehabilitative aspects when it comes to, uh, to these issues, the public accuses the, the, the scientists and the intellectuals, especially for being cooperating with the terrorist groups. So this is a uh, two-edged sword. You can, you can see two, the two aspects. I wonder how you go, how in your future uh, research, how you go uh, with convincing, the first question, my question is how you would go to uh, balance these two approaches uh, to convince uh, the public. And, uh, and also what shall be done to, to go further uh, on a scientific basis. And you said that the, we need 
um, kind of evidence-based approaches, evidence-based interventions. And my question, the, the second part of my question is, how you go further to incorporate um, balancing, this balancing these two poles into an evidence-based uh, intervention program? Thank you. Team opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and your questions. Um, so convincing the public um, as to the usefulness of rehabilitative interventions in Turkey. Um, well, research shows public punitiveness has an influence on governmental punitiveness. And the vice versa might also be correct. Uh, so these two go hand in hand. I think it's not very possible to create a change in one without also tackling with the other one. Um, so still, it's not a hopeless. It is a both top-down and bottom-up effort. We could start from somewhere. And stigmatization, for example, is a, is a real problem, and that could be worked on um, in order to, to, to balance uh, the approach of the public to, uh, to the uh, interventions. How we would go around to, to do this is, um, I think, from our side, as scientists, lots of research uh, to, to show that rehabilitative interventions really work. What they would like also to hear is that it's also more cost effective than uh, punitive interventions rather than keeping people in closed spaces for, for years. It's quite possible that they can be rehabilitated in the community and you know it's good for the person, for the society and for the overall you know being of, of, of humanity, I think. So it would be cost effective and more uh, uh, more more human, I should say. Um, especially for juveniles. I mean, for me now, I'm looking forward to continuing my work with, with juveniles, especially uh, keeping them out and not keeping even one of them in a, in a closed confinement uh, would, be the, um, would be the last focus of my studies, for example. Um, I think once we start from here, maybe we'll see the difference after, after years or for the next generation, but we're not hopeless. I think we can do that. Thank you. I, I, I think that even that, yes, you, you, you said that these, they, they take a long time to, to cause a change in attitudes, and the, especially in the public attitudes. And it goes probably to the next generation. Yes, you are right on this. And I wondered also, the candidate, um, did, through your thesis, I have never seen the numbers or uh, you mentioned about 700 caseloads. And, uh, but I didn't get, are they males? Are they females? Are they, uh, are they educational backgrounds, those children, those children's familial backgrounds? And you, you have no data, you reported no data on, on this. Probably you didn't have access to this kind of data. Is that right? That's right. That's right. We do know actually the, the gender uh, um, and probably the ages, uh, of the, and they are totally open to the public over the, uh, the websites of the Ministry of uh, Justice. Uh, however, we don't have much more detail on that. So 700,000, as I said, is the number of case files, not the probationers. We don't know the exact number of the probationers here. There should be around 15,000 children I mean, those under 18, and the rest are um, um, adults. OK. OK. And another question, my question would be, even the um, more humanitarian um, approaches to correction, uh, 
lies again with the public perceptions, or, or, unfortunately, you can say, I can say at least. Uh, but Professor Eskin, uh, my apologies, uh, the chairman. The, given the time constraints, we need to go to the next opponent, uh, as we have. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for your contribution and your questions. Um, from Istanbul, we go to down under, to the other side of the world, to our next opponent, um, who is Dr. Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer is senior lecturer, School of uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice at uh, Griffith University in Australia. She was also a member of the assessment committee. Uh, we're also honored uh, that you are present today and that you uh, contribute to uh, the assessment of the, of the thesis. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for um, inviting me to form part of the assessment committee. Um, like the other members, I greatly enjoyed reading the dissertation. Um, in particular, I want to congratulate the candidate on um, a quite creative application of different theoretical frameworks to the problem of interest. I think there are some old criminal justice uh, problems, if you will, and the way that it was approached was quite um, creative and innovative. So I really appreciated that um, combined with quite um, rigorous research methodologies. Um, I think the, the candidate and the supervisory team should be commended for that. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I have a lot that I would like to discuss, so we'll see how we go for time. Um, the first thing that I might ask um, to, to pose to the candidate would be around the causal ordering um, related to attitudes in particular. So um, I can appreciate the limitations of cross-sectional data. However, I'm wondering if you might be able to speculate, given um, some of what you've already discussed around um, public opinion in Turkey, as well as things like organizational psychology and how that can influence um, sort of top-down culture that goes on to influence um, the attitudinal orientations and the conduct of frontline staff. I'm wondering if you could comment, for instance, on whether you think negative attitudes impact depersonalization or do staff potentially start with depersonalization, which then leads to negative attitudes? If you could comment on sort of the, the chicken and egg effect of attitudes and conduct, which do you think might come first here? Um, and then based on your response to that, what you think the policy and practical implications of that would be? Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and your questions. Just, I just want to clarify your question. So you're asking if depersonalization and the, the negative attitudes, right, uh, somehow are interrelated. Uh, I would speculate on that. Yeah, I'm an example of that. Yeah. Okay. There was in study chapter three, I believe it was. Chapter three, job burnout. Yes. Okay. Yes, perfect. So if we look at that as just an example of how attitudes Sorry, there's quite a severe echo there. How attitudes um, are associated with these aspects of job burnout. So if negative attitudes impact depersonalization, or do you think officers might opt to use depersonalization tactics, which then might lead to negative attitudes? So which is coming first? So uh, actually, um, your publication in 2018 gave me lots of information on that. So um, I, I was really um, very um, impressed by that work. And here uh, in that publication, I've seen that um, depersonalization might be a result, the result of some stigma, stigmatization. If, for example, if probation officers have stigmas, they may tend to depersonalize, detach themselves from, from probationers, and that might happen um, um, as a result that might be causing negative attitudes, and vice versa also should be uh, probably uh, correct. But personally, when I look at the Turkish probation officers in my personal interactions with them, um, they really wanted to be rehabilitative. 
However, things other than their um, attitudes had an effect on their depersonalizations. For example, um, the, the, the environment, the work environment. Um, in, in, the, in job burnout, also these aspects are very important and they wanted to have a better work environment, more interaction with their colleagues and more, um, more fun, for example. Because otherwise they would, they would detach themselves from work because whatever, whatever they do, they do not know it's, if it's working because they don't know if, if the recidivism rate uh, is getting lower by, by what they're doing. Um, so they were really asking for some more uh, interactions from their directors, some feedback, um, some supervision, uh, I should say. Um, so for Turkish probation officers, I think it would be more, um, first they would detach, and then probably this would be a way to cognitively uh, protect themselves, but detaching themselves would be a cognitive prote protection probably, because uh, they wouldn't really get something out of from, uh, from the job. Very good, that's very useful, thank you. Um, do I still have time for another brief question? You have time for a short question and a uh, somewhat short answer, but I will, uh, I, I will keep uh, track of the time, so go ahead. There we go, thank you. All right, so largely, sort of summarily, um, you stated at the beginning of your presentation that ultimately you set out to investigate the impact of PO's attitudes on their conduct. I'm wondering if you might be able to reflect for us on your journey as a doctoral candidate, how your attitudes potentially um, informed your conduct. Maybe your attitudes about um, the scientific process or about um, probationers or research methodologies, how have your attitudes shifted over time and if you could go back to your earlier self when you started the PhD journey what would you tell yourself to inform your conduct in a different way well I have still to a long way to go actually but since I've started uh, I think I've learned a lot and my, my attitudes and my approach has changed I think um, I managed to combine my clinical psychology background uh, with, with the research uh, I was doing. So this helped me a lot in, uh, in understanding <coughs> the needs. Dear candidates, you have some time to uh, finalize your answer if you want. So take a few seconds. So I, I, I could manage to to understand the needs and explain these to the probation officers when they were working with juveniles. I think that made a lot of difference in their uh, professional conduct also. Microphone, yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, dear candidate, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. Um, the de degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of both your thesis and your defense today here. I request that you and your company uh, await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream.
Problem-Based Learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare. Here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the skills lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real-life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies, and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get used to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. And what I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
Esra, Esra Jan. Um, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense, and in view of its positive verdict uh, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor de Ruiter is uh, authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervi supervisor to now take the floor. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. <laughs> Isa Esra Ersayan, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee present here, I hereby confer upon you, Aise Esra Ersayan, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Essayan, dear Esra, my heartfelt congratulations on obtaining your doctorate. It's very unfortunate that our dear colleague and co-supervisor, Dr. Nick Boers, cannot share this special moment with us because of health issues. And especially today, we think of him and we wish him a full and, and speedy recovery. I would also like to extend these congratulations to your partner and your children. As we all know, we could not accomplish the milestones like this without the support and patience of our loved ones. Our academic journey started back in 2015. You had gotten to know Dr. David Bernstein through your training in schema therapy. And I had discussed the option of becoming an external PhD student at Maastricht University while you remained teaching at Koch University in Istanbul. Dr. Bernstein invited me on board as a supervisor and you subsequently decided it would be best to switch supervisors. And I very much appreciated your openness immediately and your ability to communicate your feelings and your thoughts. And I do believe this is a great asset and it makes you an excellent teacher, an excellent therapist and a wonderful mother, as well as a person that's a pleasure to supervise. After we had known each other for about half a year, back in the summer of 2015, you invited my son Julian and me to spend time with you during our holiday trip we had planned to Istanbul. I have very fond memories of the dinner at your home, of Julian and your daughter Etchie playing backgammon by the side of the swimming pool, and of a rooftop dinner with your friend and colleague Zainab overlooking Greater Istanbul with all the evening lights on. The first study you conducted was a vignette study with 
a somewhat complex design. I, I, I didn't design it. <laughs> In hindsight, you said you would have used different vignettes and other sampling method instead of the snowball method, but oh well, that's in hindsight, right? You kept working diligently on getting this study written up and ultimately published. And obtaining statistical help from Nick turned out to be the start of a long-term collaboration. And later on, he became a co-supervisor officially. And this, this study resulted in your first publication as first author in the International Journal of Law, Crime, and Justice back in 2018. To, oh, <laughs> sorry. To, uh, to increase your knowledge and skills in statistics, you followed a course at my alma mater, Utrecht University, in August of 2016. And this was my opportunity to return the favor, and Ferco and I served a meal at our house in Utrecht while you were here. While working on your PhD thesis, a lot happened in Turkey and also in your private life. And as always, there was the good and the bad, the light and the darkness. In January 2016, there was a terrorist attack in Sultan Ahmed, the old city of Istanbul. And that same year, on July 15, there was a failed and quite bloody coup attempt by the military to topple President Erdogan's government, and which ultimately resulted in quite a chilling impact on domestic and foreign policy uh, in Turkey. President declared a state of emergency, continued for two years, and a lot of people, tens of thousands were arrested, and they were civil servants, military personnel, but also academics. They were sacked, suspended from their positions over suspected links with um, Fethullah Gulen, which is somebody apparently whom the government thinks is going to overthrow it. And I remember at that time you were really worried about the future in Turkey, especially for your children. And still you managed to keep your eyes on the ball, on your goal. You kept your PhD project going. In fact, in 2016, that same year, you obtained a grant from the Istanbul Development Agency to do a study with the probation service. And then later, in 2017, you landed a UNICEF grant to study the juvenile justice probation services in Turkey and compare them to similar services in Spain, Portugal, and the UK. You were not allowed to publish on, these, um, on this UNICEF project, unfortunately, but uh, you managed to conduct your own studies uh, alongside it. And all throughout, your goal has been, and it was also, again, very clear this morning, your endeavor is to make probation services more rehabilitative, which basically means making them more effective and more human. The years 2018 to 2021, you kept analyzing data from your various projects and writing them up for publication. And actually, all your empirical studies are now published in international peer-reviewed journals, with one still in the pipeline. And throughout these years, you persevered, despite also setbacks in your private life. I really admire you for that. In fact, I believe you are a perfect example of someone who has become more resilient through adversity. You've also managed to be highly successful in your role as a mother with Etche following in your footsteps as an aspiring psychologist, she graduated from Koch University, and Atta, your son, who just started his studies at Technical University Eindhoven here. It's clear 
that they are smart and up for a challenge, like their mother. Dear Ezra, it has been a great pleasure and an honor to serve as your PhD supervisor. Turkey lies at the crossing between Europe and Asia. And your thesis project has crossed boundaries and has shed light on a road towards a more modern and re rehabilitative probation system in Turkey. You can be very proud of what you have achieved. And I very much wish that you will continue to cross boundaries and build bridges between people, cultures, and continents. Thank you, Professor de Ruiter. Um, dear Dr. Ersayan, uh, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congrat you, congratulate you with the degree that you have acquired uh, today. Uh, and of course, my congratulations also extend to uh, your supervisor and your family here present uh, today. Um, you, you have a proposition and you, you state as the last proposition, writing a PhD thesis may cause permanent loss of speculation capability. <laughs> Uh, that may be true, but I sincerely hope that writing a PhD thesis does not cause permanent loss of scientific curiosity. So wishing you all the best in the future. Uh, it was lovely to be here. You did fine. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to close this academic ceremony. We're going to take a picture in front of the screen with all together, with your supervisor, the opponents, the people on the screen, uh, and perhaps after that, a photograph on the stairs in the central hall. We'll have drinks and there will be opportunity for us all to congratulate you and your family. So thank you very much. And hereby, I close this academic ceremony.